How you doing? This is Sean Vey with St. Joseph Catholic Church in Marion, Iowa. I recently had a viewer reach out to me and ask me to do a video on the rosary. So I'm just taking a moment to talk a little bit about the rosary, some of the background to it, just to give people an understanding of what is the rosary, where did it come from? To start, let me talk about the, the Hail Mary prayer that Catholics say. And what many non-Catholics may not realize is that the formulation of the Hail Mary is founded in Scripture. We are actually quoting Scripture directly in the first half of the prayer. And the second half is we're fulfilling Scripture in that we're called to pray for one another. And in fact, we are simply asking Mary to pray for us. So let me talk a little bit about this whole concept, beginning with the Hail Mary. So if you look in your scriptures in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, and if you look right beginning at verse 26, we have the recounting of the angel Gabriel appearing to Mary. So this is a messenger sent by God, and the greeting of the angel is, Hail, full of grace. Now, you look in a lot of translations today in our modern times, it might say, Greetings, favored daughter. Uh, this particular translation I'm holding, it says, Hail, favored one. Now, where does the full of grace come from? In the Catholic Church, the Latin was the designated language of the church. So St. Jerome translated the Greek and Hebrew texts into Latin, and that was called the Latin Vulgate. So when they were translating from the Latin Vulgate into English, it translates directly from Latin into English as hail, full of grace. That was the understanding of the church. Now, if you go back to the Greek text, it can be translated differently. And that's why you see in text now, um, it'll have a different rendition, a slightly different rendition in many translations. And that's where it comes from. But when the Hail Mary, when the prayer is formulated, it was when we were operating with the Latin Vulgate as our primary text. So if you ever wonder why the Catholics say that, it's because we were pulling directly from our translation of Scripture that we were using. So, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. That comes from the Scriptures here, and that is um, verse 28. Now, when Mary goes and visits Elizabeth, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit and cries out, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And that's actually the next part of what we say in the Hail Mary. We're just quoting scripture. We're quoting what the Holy Spirit has spoken to us through the word of God. So, hail full of grace. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Then, now, Mary is, a, is definitely a holy person because of what God has done. God has created her and called her to a special vocation and given her a very unique holiness. She was the mother of Jesus. So we say, Holy Mary, Mother of God. Mary became the mother of God through the incarnation. So Mary did not pre-exist God or exist from all times. No, Mary was created. But because of the will of the Father, because of the will of God, she became the mother of God. So we say, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Because guess what, everybody? We're sinners. We need God's grace and we need each other's prayers and support. We are called to pray for one another. In fact, it's James 5.16 says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another for healing. So this is a command of scripture. We're simply asking Mary to pray for us. Why? Well, we look at the wedding feast of Cana. Here you have Mary and Jesus are at this wedding and they've run out of wine. Now Mary is concerned for the married couple. She doesn't want them being embarrassed on their special day. So she goes to Jesus and says, hey, they've run out of wine. I want you to do something to help them. And Jesus says, woman, what have you to do with me? The woman is referring Mary to the woman who's prophesied back in Genesis 3.15 that the woman and her seed would ultimately crush the head of the serpent. So Jesus refers to her indicating that she is the woman, the new Eve. And he says, what have you to do with me? This is a Jewish idiom, which means whatever you say, 
because you have authority over me, I'm going to do what you say. And in fact, the demons say the same thing to Jesus. What have you to do with us? Have you come to persecute us before the appointed time? And Jesus casts them out because he has authority over them and they know that. And that's what that idiom means. So Jesus is obedient to his parents. We see that in the Gospel of Luke in the beginning. It says he, was, he went with them and was obedient unto them because he honors his father and mother. That's one of the commandments. Jesus will always honor Mary, his parent, his earthly parent, for all eternity because he will perfectly fulfill the commands that he has given us to follow. So here we have at the wedding feast of Cana, Jesus says, what have you to do with me? And she turns to the head waiter and says, do whatever he tells you. He says, fill these jars with water and pull forth and behold, a miraculous miracle does take place. He turns the water into wine so that the celebration can continue. Jesus, even though it was not yet his time, he offered this miracle because his mother asked. So we ask his mother, who has a special role, a special place in the Trinitarian family, we ask her to pray for us to her son Jesus, to the Father. And it's built into that prayer. Okay, so that's a little bit on the Hail Mary itself which was a development, and I'll also say this because it feeds into the progression of the rosary itself. It, back in old times when education is not what it is now, people couldn't, people, a lot of people weren't literate, and, but they would go to like the monks and religious and say, teach us how to pray. And so they would teach them how to memorize like the Lord's Prayer and this formulation this memorization of scripture that I just called the Hail Mary. So they would teach people these to, to memorize them so that they could use them in their prayer time. Now the Psalms are, there's 150 Psalms, depending on the translation, you have about 150 Psalms. This is a copy of the Liturgy of the Hours right here. We're in ordinary time as I'm making this video. So especially religious and priests they pray the Liturgy of the Hours. We're all invited to pray it. I love praying the Liturgy of the Hours. And in a four-week time period, we go through the 150 Psalms. But it used to be, in a, I believe in a week, they would pray all 150, the, the religious would. Now, to participate in that prayer life, the 150 prayers, the Psalms, they gave the lay people, especially the illiterate, 150 prayers to pray. So it started off with, they would give them a, a strand of beads with 150 beads on it. So you're not focused on a number, you're just praying. And as you clip through the beads, focusing on the prayer, by the time you reach the end of the beads, you've prayed 150 prayers, which was in unison with the prayer life of the monks. And so that was the early formulation of what developed into the rosary. The rosary later became popularized by saints like St. Dominic, and it took on a format. It took on a format of being separated out into decades of 10 beads, and we began to apply mysteries from the life of Jesus that we would ponder as we would say these prayers. Again, we're not focusing on a number. We're pondering the life of Christ in the rosary. And now I've had people say, you know, the, the scriptures say that we're not supposed to pray vain repetition of prayers and the, the rosary is a vain repetition of prayer. Well, this is said by people who don't understand what the rosary is. Now, here's what vain repetition in prayer is. Vain repetition in prayer is when you recite a prayer over and over thinking that you're going to be heard because of the number of times you've said it. So you're focused on getting that number in there. I'm going to say this and God's going to hear me because I'm going to say it 10 times. Well, that's a focus on the number. That's vain repetition. Jesus himself prayed the same prayer over and over in the garden of Gethsemane. He said, Father, several times, three, three times, Father, take this cup from me, yet not my will yours be done. He's repeating the same prayer. So that's not vain repetition though. He is saying a heartfelt prayer to the Father over and over because that's what's on his heart. Now, when you look at the rosary, we're not saying to ourselves, hey, I'm going to say this prayer 10 times and so God's going to hear us. We're not doing that at all. 
What we're doing in the rosary is we take the 10 beads and we say, I'm going to ponder this aspect of the life of Jesus. And when I reach the end of the 10 beads, I'm simply going to move on to the next element of Jesus's life in pondering the scriptures. So if you ever look at the rosary, the way it's laid out, these mysteries, these are mysteries from the life of Jesus. And we pray one mystery on each 10 decades. When the, so the rosary originally took on this format of three mysteries, joyful, sorrowful, and glorious, which, which equaled 150 Hail Marys. So there's five decades in the standard rosary. Actually, let me grab one. I got one sitting right over here. Here is a very simple plastic rosary. It doesn't take much. It doesn't have to be fancy. You can just use something simple to say these prayers. So the beads are set up in 10 sets of 10. That's 10 Hail Marys. And then it's separated by an Our Father. So anyway, you have five decades on a standard rosary. Sometimes you'll see religious who have a really long one. They actually have 15 decades on one rosary. But they made this is simple, easy to carry. You could pray through the whole first five mysteries, the joyful mysteries, and then go through the sorrowful and then the glorious. And now you've prayed those 150 prayers. You've actually prayed more, but that's how it evolved. And then the wonderful Pope, St. John Paul II, realized that we needed to add more to this. We need to ponder the ministry, the, the actual adult ministry of Jesus. So he incorporated the luminous mysteries. And he, he can do that, and a, a pope could do that because the rosary is, is um, it's a, a devotional prayer. It can be adjusted. It's not like a dogmatic teaching that it has to be done this way and no additions, no subtractions. No, it's a format of prayer to call us into the life of Jesus. So in the Joyful Mysteries, we look at the Annunciation, which is where, that, where we see the words of the angel Gabriel as he addresses Mary. And we look at the early, the birth of Jesus. We look at the, the presenting of Jesus in the temple, the finding of Jesus in the temple. And then when we move into the luminous mysteries, we look at the baptism of our Lord. And, and recall that we're called to be baptized as part of God's plan for salvation, so much so that Jesus had himself baptized as an example for us. So we ponder that. We look at the wedding feast of Cana. We look at the proclamation of the kingdom. We look at the transfiguration of Jesus and what that means. We look at the, the institution of the Eucharist. In the Sorrowful Mysteries, we look at the agony in the garden. We look at the scourging of the pillar. We look at the crowning with thorns. We look at the carrying of the cross. We look at the crucifixion, the hanging of Jesus on the cross, the nails going in. So we're doing these in each of these sets of decades. And when you slow your life down to ponder the life of Jesus, you begin to enter into his life in a new and profound way. So the rosary is a drawing of us into the life of Jesus. Then when we, the glorious mysteries, we look at the resurrection of Jesus. We look at Jesus ascending into heaven. We look at the God sending the Holy Spirit down upon the apostles at Pentecost. Now, as Catholics, we also believe that Mary was assumed into heaven, body and soul. And there's a lot of theological reasons. I mean, Mary being the new Eve, she experienced the original intention of God. Originally, we weren't supposed to have to die. Dying is the result of sin entering in the world and the rupturing of humanity. We have to actually be ripped from our, our fleshly body, our soul has to be, in order to go through the whole process of redemption. But Mary receiving the grace of God in advance and becoming the new Eve, it was a passing from this life into the next body and soul, which was originally the intention of God. And we also believe Mary is crowned as queen of heaven and earth. Now, some of these things are depicted in scriptures. So, for example, if you read in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, we see a woman who's clothed with the sun and a crown of 12 stars, and she gives birth to Jesus. Now, in other places in the book of Revelation, we see the souls of the saints. But here we're not seeing the soul of a woman. We're seeing a woman, the actual body of the woman. Now, in the context of that scripture passage, we hear of other people. We hear of Michael the archangel. We hear of the serpent, the devil. 
And when those, all of the people being referred to in that scripture passage, in the context, refers to the actual person first, and then what that represents. So in the situation with Mary, Mary's the one who physically gave birth to Jesus, and she's depicted as the woman clothed with the sun and the crown of 12 stars on her feet, on her, on her head, and she gives birth to Jesus in that passage. And so it first represents Mary, and then it represents some, call, say, Israel, because Jesus came through the line that came from Israel, the line of Judah. But in the context of the passage, it represents the person first. So the other images is the, the, the serpent, the dragon, represents the devil. And then it represents his whole cohort of fallen angels. And then you have Michael, who again represents Michael first, and then all of the angels who fought with him. So here we have depicted in Revelation in heaven, a woman. Who is that woman? It's the one who gave birth to Jesus. What is she wearing? A crown of 12 stars. Why is she wearing a crown? Because God has given her a special role. Jesus will always honor Mary for all eternity because he will always honor his father and mother in a special way to fulfill the commands that he has given us. So in conclusion, the rosary is a very special prayer. It's a pondering, a meditation on the life of Jesus, and it's a gift to us to help us grow closer to God. And I will say, I've been raised Catholic. I drifted from my faith early in college, only to come back to it through the grace and calling of God. And when I came back is when I decided I'm going to pray the rosary and try it because I never really gave it a heartfelt try. And in doing so, I felt like I was growing closer to Jesus in leaps and bounds. So people who speak negatively of the rosary, which it does happen, I would assume that maybe they've never given it a heartfelt try themselves. Because I think if you gave the rosary a heartfelt try, you would experience yourself growing closer to Jesus, which is the point of it all. So I encourage you to continue, continue to pray the rosary if you already do. If you have been opposed to it up until now, Consider what is actually happening when someone prays the rosary and see if maybe God will call you to pray to him, to grow closer to him through this format of prayer, through quoting of scripture and through pondering the life of Jesus. Again, I'm Sean McVeigh, and I want to thank you once again for tuning into this video. Until next time, take care and God bless.